listening to Shoot It Now, your weekly podcast about indie filmmaking and big budget films with award winning filmmaker Craig Newland. And welcome to another Shoot It Now podcast. My guest today is an Oscar nominee film producer for the film Little Miss Sunshine. He's also produced the 2002 film Adaption starring Nicolas Cage. Also, Safety Not Guaranteed, Loving, The Farewell, A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood starring Tom Hanks and has a film premiering at Sundance called Land, which is Robin Wright's debut film. Peter Sarif, welcome to Shoot It Now. Hi there. Nice to be here. Now, you're based in New York. You have an office in Los Angeles, but are independent and not joined at the hip with any studio. So you're free to explore and green light whatever films appeal to your sensibility. Uh, Most producers can only dream of this, but it wasn't always this way. You had a beginning as a producer, so that's where I want to start. You didn't go to film school, but rather Silence of the Lambs director Jonathan Demme came into your life early on and made an indelible impression on you. Tell me a little bit about that, how that all evolved. Sure. Uh, Yeah, no, that's right. I didn't go to film school. I I studied theater. Uh, When I got out of school, I... um, I sort of I wasn't like the most focused driven person in the world. I knew I've always known my whole life that I wanted to be involved in storytelling. I ended up traveling around for a while. I lived in Indonesia for about a year working with the theater company there. And when I came back to the States, I through, you know, some people I knew, I found out that Jonathan Demi was looking to hire a office manager and I applied for that job. You know, I'd done some work around the film industry, mostly as a PA and other stuff, but applied for the job as Jonathan's office manager, got the job and ended up working with him for about 10 years, becoming his producing partner along the way, first producing some documentaries and then some narrative features. The first narrative film I I did with him was a great American filmmaker named Victor Nunez directed. It was a film called Yuli's Gold that starred Peter Fonda. It was sort of his comeback movie. He ended up up winning the Golden Globe for Best Actor and was nominated for an Oscar for that film. Uh, And I just continued working with Jonathan, making films that he directed, some documentaries, a lot of, we did a lot of stuff with music, a lot of filmed, a lot of live performances and music videos with Bruce Springsteen and Neil Young and Robin Hitchcock and various others, and some narrative features as well. Like you mentioned, Spike Jones's adaptation and Jonathan's movie. I worked a little bit on Philadelphia and Beloved, and then and we made uh, The Truth About Charlie. And then after that, I parted ways very amicably with, with Jonathan and Ed Saxon, his other producing partner, and became an independent producer. So that really was your film school, wasn't it? What a, what a gift. Absolutely. It was more than any other kind of film school <laughs> you can imagine. Um, it was an extraordinary gift. Jonathan was a, an incredible mentor, an incredible artist, and, uh, and a great friend. And the landscape of the film industry has had a monumental shift. We used to ask, how has the film industry changed over the last five years, which seemed recent when we were asking that question. But now that's a distant memory because the film industry has radically changed over the last 12 months, forever changed, some people will say. We have the very real possibility of cinemas being forced to close as a result of the streamers complete dominance over a cinema chain's viability as a business model. So, Peter, how do you view the last 12 months of change with the industry from a producer's point of view? Well, look, these these are trends that have been going on for a while. Our whole world has changed in unimaginable ways in the last 12 months. I don't think that the theatrical experience is going away. It's obviously been, you know, as with all collective experience, anything where we might gather together and share an experience, whether it be a movie, the theater, live music, you know, sitting around a campfire, that's all been put on hold, on pause. And and it's tragic. Um, It's tragic for the audiences. It's tragic for the artists who, who work that way. But we're starting to see some positive movement towards science, which will allow us to gather again. Um, The vaccine, even though it's not getting distributed as as well as we'd hoped, but it's out there and and we will get to a point where we can get past this 
unbelievably tragic health crisis and, and gather again. And I think that people will want to gather again. Yes, streaming has changed the film industry immeasurably, but people are going to be so hungry. People already are so hungry to get out of their homes and share stories together that they're going to go back to movie theaters and things will change. You know, that look, since the advent of home entertainment, you know, the vast majority of audience have seen my films and any other films at home. There's been that theatrical element of it first, but over time, more people have seen movies by a factor of many at home. So now how much has that shifted? Uh, you know, I think it's hard to say. The economics have shifted radically. That's something we just all have to adjust to. And the waterfall of revenue for a film like yours, Adaption, that you produced in 2002, it had the DVD sales component, which for any film in the past was like a, a lifeboat if a film was mediocre for its theatrical release. But we have lost that safety net of income for a film with the DVD. Now we have, in 2021, the theatrical distribution potentially struggling for its survival. In many ways, a wide theatrical release is an intrinsic part of revenue waterfalls uh, bringing in billions of dollars for the studio's biggest tent poles. So it's hard to imagine that the studios would just walk away from that. No, they won't walk away from that. And look, for the for sort of specialized cinema, independent cinema, whatever you want to call it, the theatrical release was a very important component of it, but economically was always something of a, of a lost leader for the rest of the revenue. You know, you were lucky to break even on the theatrical release when you factor in, you know, the print and advertising cost, which is enormous. And the fact the the movie theater chain takes in, you know, about half the revenue. So at the end of the day, the distributors sometimes lost money on, on theatrical, but then would make it up in ancillary and home, home video and in, in pay TV and whatever. But what's shifted now, you know, for all the streamers, it's not about the individual performance of a film or the individual performance of a television show. It's about subscriptions. So it's just all about gaining new subscribers and, and no churn, churn being the term meaning that, you know, not losing subscribers. So you want to get them and then you want to retain them. And for most of these companies, which are publicly traded, it's about hitting numbers on a quarterly basis that please Wall Street or whatever, you know, the, the, the markets so that the stock price goes up. And that's, that's the economic structure that's going on at these streamers. And what the pandemic has done is turn a lot of the traditional studios, we've seen it most radically at Warner Brothers, into essentially streaming companies. So the economics have changed. That's why I say the economics have changed radically, that that's the motivation for the financier and the distributor. So where does that put the, the rest of the economy in terms of getting a movie made and how much money you make off of it? That's what's changed for producers and directors and actors and writers and everybody involved. Um, and that's what we're all adapting to. You make a good point because I do wonder about streaming series and the way that an episodic series can drop all at once on a platform which highly incentivizes the viewer to watch and to also, just as importantly, maintain their subscriptions versus watching one-off feature films. So if you play out the business model, which you're alluding to, because they are there to make money for shareholders, which is fair enough, they're in business to make money, it's easy to see that a series has a far greater retention value than a movie does. Or is that just the cynic in me? No, that's certainly been the calculus that has been at work. So, you know, the, the big streaming companies, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, etc., they have put a lot of emphasis in the last few years on, on series because you retain, you know, a lot more, you get a lot more subscribers and you retain them for longer if you give them multiple episodes and multiple seasons. So you saw it with House of Cards, you saw it with Stranger Things, you saw it with Fleabag and you know, all the different defining shows that really put these streaming platforms on the map. And then, you know, you, you keep people subscribed because they not only want to watch the 10, 12, 15 episodes of a season, they want the next season to come. So they, that's where all the emphasis has been. What we've seen, interestingly, in the last six months or so with, you know, the global theatrical market completely shut down or practically completely shut down is that the streamers saw an opportunity 
to get that feature audience and they 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 shifted back i mean that they they were always in the, the feature phone business all of these companies you know and you get and you got to put apple and all the others in there as well they have very you know they're spending a ton of money on movies as well as series it's just the emphasis was on series and now i've been seeing a little bit of a shift back to yes let's you know series are still very very important and they're not going away and they're not diminishing but let's put our eye back on features a little bit I'm glad to hear from a producing point of view that you feel that the emphasis has come back to film because the marketing of a series versus a film, a lot of the time with new content on a streaming platform, I'm not even sure whether it's a series at first glance or a film. Now, a film that I thought was a movie often turns out more often than not to be a series. So I think that they were cunningly redefining the way that we perceive a series to look at it like a movie. No, I think that's true. And I, but I think that that changed, you know, also in terms of, and this started to shift really back in the days of premium cable, you know, probably led most by HBO in terms of the kind of the, the quality of the work that was going into the series and the vocabulary of, of storytelling that was being used in episodic storytelling really started to resemble film. And you saw it in, in series like The Wire, and then you saw it in, in Sopranos, and, and then certainly you get into something like Game of Thrones where the budgets and the production value starts to rival that of you know massive budget movies. And that was a real shift. And as bad as last year was, and it was a hellish year on the film industry. You personally did have something positive to show for it after backing The Farewell, which got nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Foreign Language Film. And that was great for you, but also Marielle Heller's A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood, which saw Tom Hanks nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor. And he also got an Oscar nomination. Under your production umbrella of Big Beach, the year at least started off really well for you. Not everyone can say that about 2020. How did mm. you review last year for both yourself and Big Beach Productions? Yeah, I mean, look, the, those two movies came out in 2019 and then, you know, hit the award circuit in 2020. And yeah, you know, and I, I was thrilled with the reception for both those films, both critically and, and commercially and, and on the awards level. And, and Aquafina, you know, being the first Asian American woman to win Best Actress at the, at the Golden Globes. And then we won the Independent Spirit Award. And then with Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Tom's first nomination in 16 years, which it's kind of shocking to everybody, I think, including Tom, who you kind of imagine that he gets nominated every year, but it's been a long yeah. time. But those movies were made, you know, finished in 2019, released in 2019. And 2020 was a tough year. We managed to finish uh, Robin Wright's movie, her directorial debut, The Charity also stars in, um, called Land. Um, and that's coming out, like you said, at the top of the show, that's coming out at, at Sundance. And then Focus is releasing it shortly thereafter to the public. And we were able to shoot an episodic piece right in the middle of the lockdown in, in New York. We shot a piece called These Days, a, a spec pilot for a series. We shot entirely remotely, um, shipping equipment, iPhones and sound equipment and a little bit of lighting and props and costumes and whatnot. We shot, shipped everything to actors' homes and they acted as their own crew. The director, writer-director Adam Brooks and our DP and our sound team and technical director and myself and other producers would, would join via Zoom and uh, the actors would see each other. That show uh, turned out great. And it's, you know, with full coverage shooting, not just, you know, it's not a Zoom show. It's a real show. I'm thrilled with it. And that's going to premiere at Sundance as well. And what genre is that? It's a, you know, I think you'd call it a dramedy. It's really, you know, it takes place in the middle of the lockdown in New York and people seeking connection with one another. And there's quite a bit that's funny in it. There's a quite a bit of pathos as well. And it's a checking in on, on, on where we were in that moment. And there's plans for a full season of that to, to have a record of, of the time and also just to get to that universal basic human need, which is to connect with one another and when we're isolated. Our other show, Sorry for Your Loss, also finished its second and final season. We had two other documentaries that premiered in 2020. We filmed a Broadway show performed and written by the genius woman Heidi Schreck called What the Constitution Means to Me. And that 
premiered on Amazon Prime in October. A very powerful piece. And then we did a film about Harry Belafonte in the week in 1968. So we were able to make some stuff and get some stuff out there. We had a few movies that we were supposed to shoot in 2020 that were put on hold. It was a tough year in a lot of ways, and, and we muddled through in other ways. I'm interested to share the story of how you decided to take a leap of faith with The Farewell, because a lot of producers would, in fact, run from anything that has subtitles. But mm -hmm. one thing that streamers like Netflix has done because of the international content, which has appeared on streaming platforms with so much in the way of subtitles, in a way it has softened up the numbers that can be achieved through foreign language films, or at least that's my take on it. So was that a factor in your decision to just go for it as a producer and back that film, The, the Farewell, which had so much critical attention? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, look, the story <laughs> takes place almost entirely in China with Chinese speaking people. So what are you going to, I love the story. When I first heard it, on the podcast, it felt like a movie to me. I didn't realize Lulu was a filmmaker until I got in touch with Ira Glass, the host of that show, and told me, yeah, she's a filmmaker, call her up. I, I just loved the story, but there was no other way to tell it. What are you gonna do to have it like people speak English with Chinese accents? It's it's ridiculous. So yes, it was something of a risk and, and I was nervous about it. We made the movie on a low budget and a not necessarily, you know, on the face of it, super commercial story and Aquafina being an up and coming star, but up and, but, you know, sort of a rising talent, but unproven. And so for all those reasons, let's do this, make the movie modestly in terms of budget. So that was a risk, but we didn't really have a choice about the language that it would be in. But I did think that there was a shift and I'd seen it with my own kids, teenagers, you know, when they turn on Netflix, even when they're watching something in English, they often put those closed captions on. And I think part of it is like they're supposed to be doing homework and they're watching something on Netflix on their computer <laughs> and they don't want anybody to know um, or, or whatever it is. I, but I, and my kids aren't alone. I see a lot of this. Like kids are reading the show while they watch it. And then, like you say, you know, there is all the content on Netflix or Amazon Prime or all these other streaming services, they're bringing us a lot of content from other countries and other languages in subtitled or dubbed. Every show seems to be available in maybe over 100 languages. And that's extraordinary. And it's opened up the world to different perspectives and different kinds of storytelling from different, different corners of the world. And that, to me, is magical and wonderful. And you saw it play out. One of the things that's most gratifying about the farewell for me is that nobody even mentions that it's in 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 Chinese. And I didn't read one article or one review that talks about the subtitles. And that to me was the most satisfying thing. And then you see a movie like Parasite win Best Picture at the Oscars. It was quite the year for non-English language films. Uh, and I think that that is a great omen for the future. And um, and I think it's something that's here to stay. And your new movie, which is premiering at Sundance this year called Land, which is Robin Wright's debut film. A brief description about the film. A local hunter brings a grieving lawyer back from the brink of death after she retreats to the harsh wilderness of the Rockies. Peter, tell us about how the film came across your producing desk and also about the prospect of working with an actor who has a vast amount of experience of being on so many different film sets and now Robin Wright turning her hand to directing. The script came to me via a, a lawyer and agent and old friend of mine, a guy named John Sloss, who had been working with, with Robin and, and Alan Stewart, one of the other producers. They, they brought it to me as both a producer and a financier. And I just, I thought it was an extraordinary piece of writing and a great role for Robin. Uh, and I met with Robin and I've worked with actors on who become directors a few times. I, I did uh, a film called Everything is Illuminated, which was Lee, the Lee of Schreiber's directorial debut. I did a film called Jack Goes Boating, which was Philip Seymour Hoffman's directorial debut. So I had some experience with that. And I think actors who are who are passionate about what they do or, or and, and have enough experience, they can make great directors. And, and meeting with Robin and realizing that she had a really strong vision for the film. She directed, I think, 10 episodes of House of Cards. So she, you know, it's different. 
um, directing television, but she, she had a familiarity with being behind the camera and she had a familiarity with directing herself. And that was probably the biggest challenge. This movie is about a woman who leaves everything behind in Chicago, her life behind in Chicago and retreats to a cabin on the top of a mountain in Wyoming with no electricity, no phone, no running water, because she just cannot be around other people. She needs to, she's getting to a point in her life where she, she can't function uh, except in isolation. And so the, a huge chunk of the movie, probably more than half of the movie, is just Robin with no dialogue. So it was an extraordinary acting challenge and an extraordinary challenge to direct herself in that with no, nobody else to turn to. But I could tell by her determination and her vision for it that she was up for the challenge, and uh, that proved to be true. And the trailer looks very brutal with the harsh outdoor wilderness setting. Where did you shoot the film, and what were some of the challenges completing it from a producing point of view? Well, we shot the film up in Calgary um, on a mountain about an hour and a half, two hours outside the city of Calgary uh, called Moose Mountain. We built a cabin up at the top of this mountain. And um, yeah, nature nature is harsh. Um, nature is a challenge. And living without any kind of modern convenience is, is difficult. And it was, it was hard during production. We shot in uh, September. I think we started at the end of August in, into September, October. We had budgeted for a winter unit because, you know, the movie takes place over years. So you needed all four seasons on this in our exterior location. So we budgeted for a winter unit, complete the major board of photography and then come back once there was snow. And then in early September, I think we got eight feet of snow over one night. So the, (laughs) the conditions were very harsh. We didn't have to come back for a winter unit. What we ended up having to do was come out and melt snow in order to get fall and spring. And we had crazy winds that shut us down for a couple of days. I mean, you know, 80, 90 mile per hour winds, things blowing off the mountain. So there were a lot of harsh conditions, a lot of wildlife around. We had a, a bear wrangler. We do have a scene with a bear in the movie, uh, but this was just to keep bears off of our set um, and things like that. So it was, it was hard. So in your filmography, this is about as close as you'll get to The Revenant. <laughs> it wasn't quite that extreme, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was a pretty hard production. And for our indie filmmakers, what did you shoot the film on and how many shooting days for Land? I think Land was 30 and we shot on an Alexa. And as you mentioned, you've got a couple of films that are appearing at Sundance. Sundance is virtual this year, which is the... You know, it's unfortunate as a result of COVID, but I suppose one of the upswings is that a lot more people will see the film virtually. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this will it'll be a Sundance unlike any others. The first first time I went to Sundance was in 1996 with the, the movie I mentioned earlier, Yuli's Gold. I've lost count of how many films I've had at the festival. It's been a huge part of my career and my life. And so it's weird to not be getting on a plane to, to Salt Lake City in January, uh, as that's been a big routine in my life for many years. But um, we'll see how the festival goes. I'm, I, you know, I, I, I'm always amazed by the resilience and the ingenuity of that group of people in that community. And I think this year will we'll be unlike any other, and we'll see what the experience is like. But I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Peter, it's been educational finding out about your producing career and all of the choices that you have made along the journey of your filmography to date. All the best for Sundance and future endeavours and with your movie Land in particular. And thanks for coming on Shoot It Now and talking about some of these aspects to your career. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Craig. You've been listening to Shoot It Now with Craig Newland, your weekly podcast about all things behind the camera and in front of it. Until next time, have a great week.